I was glad when they said to me, let us go into God's house, because this is the day the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. If you're happy to be in God's presence, let me hear you say amen. amen. I want to thank our praise team. Were you blessed by the ministry of the praise team? If you're blessed by the ministry of the praise team, put your hands together. We thank God for our praise team, our musicians, our sound engineers, our tech team, and all those who are doing their part to bless our hearts. It's good to see your face in the place and your feet beneath the seat. And thank you for joining us in this, the second service at this, I dare say, Pastor Rose, the best church in Broward County. Dare I say, Flor Fort Lauderdale and Florida. I thought they would say amen to that. <laughs> Good to see you all here today. Welcome. This is the culmination of our Jesus at the Center Evangelistic Series, a yearly event. And we're so grateful for all of you who have been journeying with us since last Sabbath. And we're so happy that you are with us today, both in the building and online. Thank you. Thank you for joining with us online. And the whole purpose of this, my friends, is to remind us that Jesus ought to be center and central to our life and existence. And we're happy for those who have made the decision and given their hearts to Jesus. Let's rejoice with those who have said yes to Jesus in baptism. Elder Alex, thank you for the work you continue to do with a team to study with individuals, for our prayer team, and for everyone else. Thank you for what you do. Now, we still believe that God reminds us that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand pleasures forevermore so let's share the love go ahead turn to your neighbor turn to your neighbor and i want you to repeat after me say to your neighbor say neighbor i look good but you look even better <laughs> amen somebody amen 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 by the way don't tell any lies in church you better mean it <laughs> you better mean it i want to welcome everyone that's here today but again, my friend Noveen is here, and her mom Nova, and her mom Nova celebrated, and their husband Richard, and their baby Josh. I think Josh is here, but her mom celebrated her 25th birthday this week, and from I've known her, she's been 25, you know? <laughs> but happy birthday to you, Nova, and we pray God will continue to bless you with many more. And yesterday, Pastor Forbes' daughter celebrated her birthday. We're happy for her as well. God bless you all as you celebrate. I don't know if you know this, the best month of the year happens to be the month in which Jesus was born, amen? And that's the month of April. So for all of you who are born every other time, that's all right. We love you still. We love you. We love you. I can't prove it from Bible yet, but I believe he was born in April where I, when I was born. Amen, amen. The best month of the year. <laughs> But we're so grateful. We've been here since last week, and God has been blessing us. And we're going to culminate this service today, and we're doing so under the caption, Yom Kippur. And I want you to follow me carefully and intensely and be blessed by God's word so that all of us can be made ready for the second coming of Jesus. Stand with me and take your Bibles in hand. Time is well spent, and the objective is to get you out of here before 12 midnight. So let's move with alacrity of speed. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. I'm reading from the New King James Version. You can follow it along whatever version you have. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. The Word of God reads this. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Pray with me. Father, our desire is that Jesus will be the center of our lives and of our joy and help us all to understand that there is no true joy without Jesus Christ bless the reading and readers the listening and listeners of your holy word speak clearly speak audibly and may all understand accept and do your will in Jesus name we pray let everybody say 
you may be seated in the presence of God. By way of a recap, last week we started, and we started in Daniel 2. And Daniel 2, verses 1 to 24, we discovered that God is not an absentee God who is indifferent to our needs and our situation. When Daniel found himself in a position where the only solution to his problem was prayer, God heard and God answered his prayer. This reminds us today, my friends, that God still hears and still answers prayer. And so we still believe that there is power in prayer. If you believe there's power in prayer, let me hear you say amen. amen. The next sermon focused on the latter part of Daniel 2, where we trace the history from Nebuchadnezzar's time all the way down to the end of times. And the Word of God declares that kingdoms come and kingdoms go. But one day there will come a kingdom that will never be removed, and this is the kingdom of our God, and it will be established when Jesus comes again. I don't know if you believe this, my friends, but given all that is happening in our world, Jesus is coming again. If you believe Jesus is coming, let me hear you say amen. amen. And then we went to Wednesday evening where we looked at the issue, saved by grace, rewarded by works. And the Word of God makes it clear in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that by faith we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God and not of our works, lest anyone should boast. But when God saves us, He doesn't save us to keep on sinning. He saves us from sin. That is why we are rewarded by our works. The Bible makes it clear that God will bring every work into judgment. And so, if we are saved, we live by faith. James makes it clear in James 2 verse 17 that faith without works is dead. You can say you're a child of God, but live like someone else. If you're a child of God, you must live like a child of God. If you believe that, let me hear you say amen. And then we looked at it last night. We went to the sanctuary where we are told that our sins are transferred to the sanctuary because of the lamb that is slain. And John makes it clear in John 1 verse 29 that Jesus is the lamb that is slain for our sin. Behold the lamb of God, John says, which taketh away the sin of the world. And the beauty about Jesus is this, my friends. Once he takes away your sins, he doesn't remind you of your past. On the contrary, he he tells you that you have a bright future in Jesus Christ. If you're grateful for your future in Jesus, please say amen. amen. Now today we will move from the holy place into the most holy place because I don't know if you know this, beloved, but according to Scripture, the, the, the tenth day of the seventh month, according to Leviticus 16, is a day called Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And for the Jews, today is that day. Since sunset yesterday, they've been celebrating Yom Kippur, and it will culminate this evening at sunset. A day of judgment, a day of atonement. And we want to understand more about this, and so we'll be looking at this idea of judgment through the lens of Daniel 8 verse 14 where the Bible says on to 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now beloved one of the reasons I love this church and I believe this church is because this church is rooted in the prophecies of God's word. You will quickly note that this doctrine of the sanctuary and about the 2,300 days is not taught by any other church. It therefore means that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is unique not because of the state of the dead. We believe when you're dead, you're dead. Not because of the second coming, because we're not the only ones that believe Jesus is coming again. We're unique, beloved, not even because of the Sabbath, because we're not the only ones who keep the Sabbath, but we're unique because this church was literally birthed out of the study of Daniel 8 and all the other uh, prophecies of Daniel, 
And people realized, people realized, the pioneers realized that this was an important study. And so we're going to walk carefully and follow me intently as we walk through this to understand what is going on here. In the 1840s, beloved, they had what you call the great religious awakening in this country and in some parts of Europe. People were studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And they concluded, based on the study of Daniel 8, verse 14 and other verses, that Jesus was coming soon. And as they studied the prophecies, they calculated the date down to the day, which was October 22, 1844. And so these people were made up of Christians from various churches, from the Methodist Church, from the Baptist Church, from the Presbyterian Church and others. And they came together and studied and determined that when the text says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, it meant that Jesus was coming again to earth and he would clean the earth by fire and he would do so on October 22, 1844. History tells us that William Miller and the Millerites, some of them even made wide, made wide robes waiting for Jesus to come. But at midnight and then a minute after midnight, they didn't see Jesus and they were ridiculed. Why? Because the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, verse 36, that of the day and the hour, no man knoweth the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven. And if God didn't reveal it to the angels, he hasn't revealed it to any man. So hear me now, my friends. If anybody tells you that they know when Jesus is coming again, don't believe it. It's a lie from the pits of hell. Only God the Father and God the Son knows when Jesus is coming again. If you believe the preacher, say amen. Now this also teaches us something very important. Because you don't know when Jesus is coming again, you must be ready and stay ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, beloved, they studied, and as they studied, they came to realize that if you wanted to understand the sanctuary in heaven, because they believed there was one there, you needed to study the sanctuary in earth. So let me tell you a little about the sanctuary in earth. You can find this in Exodus. Exodus 25 to 29, you can find this in Leviticus 16, specifically about the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, which was on the 10th day of the seventh month. The Bible tells us that on that day, the high priest would firstly have to make sacrifice for himself. And then he would get two goats. One for the Lord's goat, the other was a scapegoat or called as a zeal. And then he would confess the sins of all the people and he would cut the throat of the goat and take the blood inside the tabernacle, not the first part of the sanctuary, but the second part where you had the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was made of a specific wood and was overlaid with gold and then on top of it was called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat, beloved, had on top of it two angels that were looking down in the mercy seat. Their wings touched at the top and it touched at the bottom. And they were looking down. And you want to know why they were looking down? They were looking down, beloved, because they were amazed at the mercy and the grace of God. Let me tell you something, my friends. You are not alive today because you are the chief executive officer of oxygen or the air, air you breathe. The only reason you're alive is because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Oh, beloved, let me tell you this. If it were up to the devil, you'd be dead in your sins and long gone. And you know how often he has arranged circumstances for you to be dead. But the angels of the Lord that encampeth round about just stepped in right on time and spared you. Today, you ought to be grateful for the mercies of Jesus Christ. Oh, I tell people, my friend, every day you get up and you go out and you come in, don't take 
it for granted because you don't keep yourself. You don't spear yourself. Many times you're driving on the turnpike or on 95 and the devil arranged for an accident to happen, but God just protected you and shielded you. And then you come to church and you want to sit dead like God ain't do nothing for you. Let me remind you when God has been good to you, you need to bless the Lord at all times. It is the mercies of God that is keeping us. And the Bible tells us that the angels look down. But you know why they were looking down? They were looking down, beloved, because we need mercy and grace because we have sinned. And the angels are amazed, beloved, because God has a problem. You see, God has to get rid of sin but he wants to save sinners. So how do you get rid of sin while saving sinners? Well, the Bible tells us about that plan. You see, you see, the blood which represents the blood of the one who can save us was brought in and sprinkled before the Ark of the Covenant. And this blood was sprinkled because we break God's law. The Bible makes it clear in 1 John 3 verse 4 that sin is lawlessness or sin is the transgression of God's law. So we have 10 commandments in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, and when you break them, you sin. And if anyone here today can declare that you are without sin, you just committed your first sin because you're telling a lie. Because the Bible says all have sinned. How many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So these are they. Number one, the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, there is only one true God and you can't put any other God before him. He was God all by himself before you were here. He is the uncaused cause of every other cause and he is the only God that deserves to be worshipped. So don't make your money a God. Don't make your education a God. Don't make your husband or your wife or God. There's only one true God. He is in heaven and he deserves to be worshipped. The second one says, don't make any graven image and don't worship them. We don't worship idols. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship saints. We don't worship angels because the word of God says, don't make any image and don't worship them. And the point is this, my friend. If you can make something and then worship it, it has been made in your image and so you be worshiping something you have made but we are supposed to worship the one who has made us and he is God all by himself number three says thou shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain our beloved this one is very important because some of us use God's name flippantly everything we're cursing and swearing we use God's name we are talking and we talk as if God's name is just so light and must be used trivially. I want to remind you God is a holy God and we must be careful. The Jews, beloved, don't even say that name. Sometimes they're reading, they pass over it because the name is holy. It also means, beloved, that if you say you're a Christian, that is the third commandment which says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. It also means that if you're a Christian and you say you're a Christian, you must live like a Christian. One of the things that fascinates me about some Christians, they behave more like dragons and like some wild beasts. And if you are a child of God, you ought not to be behaving like a dragon. The only dragon there is is Satan. But if you're a child of God, live like a child of God. If you don't live like a child of God, you're taking his name in vain. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Lord, Sabbath of the Lord thy God. What that teaches is this. There is only one day that God has designated for a day of worship. It's not Sunday. It's not Monday. It's not Tuesday. It's not Wednesday. It's not Thursday. It's not Friday. It's Saturday or the seventh day. And if you don't know which day is the seventh day, just ask the Jews. They've been celebrating it for years. Or ask your teacher because when I went to school, they taught me that the days of the week, the first day is Sunday. Then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 
Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And the Bible says, beloved, you must worship God on the day that he has designated. So hear me, my friends. We don't believe what pastor says or what some other person says. We believe what the Word of God says, and the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The next one, number five, says, ah, you must honor your parents, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Let me tell you what that's talking about, beloved. Children must be taught to respect parental authority. And this is very important, beloved, because the first authority that children have is parental authority. And if they can't respect parents, they won't respect teachers. And if they can't respect teachers, they won't respect nobody else. And if they can't respect nobody else, they won't respect God. And you wonder why some of our children are indifferent to religion. We live in a day and an age, beloved, where the tail wags the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. But today I declare on the authority of God's word, if there's one place where children must obey their parents, it is in the church of the living God. Number six says, thou shalt not kill. Now I know all of you are good people. You're not going to take a gun, a knife, and go kill nobody. And praise God, I know you're not going to do that. But the Bible says, if you hate anybody, you've committed murder. And it amazes me because there are Christians that hate each other. I, want to wonder, I often wonder, if you hate me, what heaven do you plan to go to? And the thing that fascinates me about this, there's some people who hate people who have been dead for years and gone. My friend, let it go and give your life to Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. The Bible also says this, beloved. Jesus says that your hate can result in you assassinating the character of someone else. There's some people who only come to church to watch people. You watch what they wear. You watch what they drive. You watch what they do and all of that. And all you are good at is cutting them down with your tongue. James chapter 3 makes it clear that you can tame everything else but the tongue. But today I declare if you can't find anything good to say, say, then shut your mouth and stop criticizing and cutting down people. Somebody say amen. amen. The next one says, the next one says, and I'm going to park here for a while. Number seven says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Can, can I tell you what that means? It means, beloved, that if you're not married, you don't do what married people do. All right, the church is quiet. So let me say amen for you. Amen. Hello, somebody. The Bible says it's a sin. And don't tell me, oh, pastor, I have to sample the product before I buy it. Really? Hey, let me tell you something. I prefer to do what God says because the Bible says to taste before grace is disgrace. So if you want to... <laughs> if you want to enjoy the pleasures that God has given to you, ladies, tell them to put a ring on it. Somebody say amen. Amen. Don't, don't, don't let them be milking the cow free of cost. Amen? The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And by the way, by the way, this speaks to any form of sexual perversion, whether pornography, whether homosexuality or lesbianism and all of these things. The Word of God declares that it is a sin. And we must stand on the authority of God's Word because when you do that, you are breaking the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. The next one says, thou shalt not steal. Ah, uh, brethren, again, I know you all are good people. You're not going to steal nothing from nobody. But hear what I'm saying to you. Hear what I'm saying to you. If a friend lend you some money, don't let them have to ask you for it. All right? I know you're not going to say amen. I'll say it for you. Amen. amen. You know, somebody sent me something the other day, and I smiled. Somebody sent me something the other day of a scenario where, listen to this, a young lady loaned a friend $3,000 and promised, and the person promised, I'll pay it back at a certain time. And now, <laughs> they didn't want to pay it back. So they don't have any money, they can't pay it back. Fussing out the friend, oh, I can't pay you, I can't pay you. And then the friend said, I need, I need my money. And so the person agreed, okay, I'll send you back $2,000 when I can. 
Well, the morning after the person sent the money, the friend woke up and noticed about 50 calls on her phone. And then she checked her bank account. And the friend who never had the money accidentally added a zero to the 2,000. And instead of sending 2,000, sent 20,000. <laughs> And then calling, begging the friend, oh, please send back $18,000. Listen, pray for me, brethren, because if they ever send that to me. <laughs> Number one, you couldn't pay me back my money. Huh? And now you accidentally send me $20,000. I think that's a sign from God that you've sent me my money plus interest. Come on, say amen. <laughs> The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. The next one says, thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, some of us lie for no reason. And we can hold a straight faith even when we know that we're doing the work of the devil. The Bible says, lying lips are an abomination unto God, but they that deal truly are his delight. The next one makes it clear, beloved, that thou shalt not covet. Don't covet what your neighbor has. Why? Because if God blesses them, you must celebrate what God is doing in their life, and God can do and will do the same for you. If you believe the preacher say amen. amen these are the ten commandments and because we break them there is sin and God has to deal with sin and so what does he do this day of atonement or Yom Kippur is designed where throughout the year all the sins are be transferred to the sanctuary and now there's a day for them to be blotted out it's called the day of atonement or Yom Kippur. Now, what Daniel 8 verse 14 teaches us is simply this. Just as how there was a day of atonement under the Levitical system that was instituted by Moses and Aaron, well, instituted by God and given to the people through Moses and Aaron, there is another great day of atonement and that day had a specific date just as the one under Moses and Aaron. Under Moses and Aaron, it was the tenth day of the seventh month. But under this prophecy of Daniel 8, there is one and it started at a certain time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this because you have to understand how serious this is. And then I'll take my seat. Number one. Sin is the problem that God has to deal with. And some of us think we can hide our sins. Or that our sins are of no consequence like this woman who was married to a man who ended up in a wheelchair and was an invalid. And she was begging God for the man to die. You know, we go to the altar and we say, for better or worse, sickness in and hell till death do us part. Well, she took that part literally. She said, death will do us part. You know what she did? To get some insurance money, she secretly nailed a hammer in her husband's head. And when she did that, she combed his hair, wiped away all the blood, made sure nothing was there, and combed his hair in such a way that it would not be detected. Eventually, not long after, the man died, and because of his condition, his doctors had no suspicion and said, you know what, we understand the situation, and so he died they pronounced him dead of natural causes. Well, a few years later, something interesting happened. At that cemetery where the man was buried, the soil was being compromised in such a way that they had to excavate or, or exhume all those bodies to relocate them. And when they exhumed the body of this man, the skeleton revealed that the nail was in the head. Of course, they had to report this to the authorities. And when they did, they confronted the woman, and after careful confrontation and interrogation, the woman then declared, God has finally found out my sins. Now, what she didn't realize is that God knew her sins all along. Because the Bible says, even if you make your bed in hell, God is there, and the darkness cannot hide you. It was a government who now found out. And so she paid the penalty, but the Bible makes it clear, beloved, 
that on that day of atonement, which is also day of judgment, because when you compare Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8, you realize that after the kingdoms, there is a day of judgment according to Daniel 7 verse 10 onward. And then in Daniel 8 verse 14, it is clearly indicated that the cleansing of a sanctuary is synonymous to the day of judgment. And the Bible therefore declares this, and I want you to get it. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. Read it with me. What does it say? Let's read it together. For we must what? All appear where? Before the judgment seat. So every last one of us here has an appointment with the judgment seat of God. And none of us will escape. And the Bible tells us why. That each one may receive the thing done in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Now, I'm going to be emphasizing this because we live in a day and age where many Christians and many people believe that it doesn't matter what you do. And so anything goes, you can live however, as long as you say you love Jesus and you claim you've given your heart to him, uh, it doesn't matter. Well, the Bible makes it clear, it matters what you do because God will bring every work into judgment. There are myriads of texts in the Bible that says this. Look at this one. The Bible says in is Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14 listen what it says the Bible says for God will bring some work how many work every work into judgment so folk listen to me everything you do God will bring it into judgment including every secret thing see that woman thought her secret had been buried and gone forever but you need to understand that even if the government don't de determine or discover it, God knows and it says whether the secret is good or whether it is evil. In other words, friends, one day all of us will get a pan panoramic view of the things we have done when we stand before the judgment seat of God. But when will that happen? How will that happen? The Bible makes it clear, however, that if your life is committed to Jesus, the blood of Jesus will wipe away all your sins. And that's the beauty about the sanctuary and the gospel. Because you have assurance that if you give your life to Jesus and live for him, he will set you free from sin. Now this idea of judgment is also evident in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 14 it says this, talking about three angels. Revelation 14 verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. You see, the gospel is not just for the New Testament believer. Some claim, oh, the gospel is New Testament. No, the gospel is everlasting from Genesis to Revelation. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God gave the gospel from then. And the Bible says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, and to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And it says this, saying with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment will come. The hour of his judgment has come. Let me show you something. Nikki, this is not in the slide, so I need you to find this for me. Let's go there. We're going to go to 1 Peter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, verse 17 also substantiates this. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, verse 17. Listen to what it says. It says, for the time has come... For judgment to begin where? At the house of God. And if it begins first, what begin with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Let me tell you this, beloved. When you accept Jesus, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the gospel. He loves you and saves you and saves you into a relationship of obedience. But he says, go back to that slide, go back to it. Go back to the text in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4 verse 17. Judgment starts with God's people. The house of God refers to God's people. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, what's going to happen when judgment comes to those who have not said yes to Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the slide quickly. Go back to the slide. I'm going to come back to that text in a minute. But look at this now. Look at this now. Go back to the slide. 
The Bible says this, therefore, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. In other words, when John wrote this, he's saying, judgment is imminent. We're living in the time of judgment, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. So we're living in a time, beloved, which is considered a time of judgment. The first angel and the second angel, the second angel message we believe, because the messengers are not angels that are going to fly in heaven. The messengers refers to God's church. And we believe that the second angel's message started in the 1840s when they studied the prophecies of Daniel and realized that the day of atonement was a day of judgment. And so, beloved, listen to this. The Bible says, therefore, in Revelation 22, verse 12, hear the preacher, hear the preacher. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man, woman, boy, and girl according to his work. So this, again, emphasizes what we said, that you're saved by grace, but you're rewarded by works. In other words, beloved, if you're saved, you must be obedient. The other night I asked this, or last night Pastor Rose asked me this. So let me see if I have a better audience here. Let me see all the women that are in relationship. Anybody here? You're married? You have a boyfriend? Ladies? Whoa, 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 whoa. Really, folks? No, no, I want to see you raise your hand. Are you married? You're in a relationship? Gentlemen, if they don't want to raise their hand, you should be concerned, you know. You should be concerned. That's a sign right there. Wonderful. Now, now, now that you've declared that you're in a relationship, what about in the overflow? Anybody in the overflow in a relationship? No? Yes? All right. I see a few hands. Now, let's say you, you love this man with all your heart. You will do anything and everything for him. That's how much you love him. But then one day you discover that he, 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 he has another woman or he cheated on you. But you love him so much that you say, honey, you know what? I, I forgive you. I forgive. No? <laughs> and this one is a rough audience. You're like, no, right? That ain't happening. Mercy. <laughs> but you forgive him. And you say, I'm giving you grace. And you give him grace. And he says, oh, honey, thank you. You're such a wonderful person. Thank you for that grace that you have given to me. But then next week... You take up this boy's phone and you realize that the same side chick that he wants to have is keep blowing up his phone and they're going out and all that. What would you do? You'd give him some more grace, right? <laughs> He's dead. No, no. The Bible says thou shalt not commit murder. We talked about that. <laughs> You're going to put a nail in his head? Lord have mercy. These women are <laughs> unforgiven. But you get the picture, therefore. You don't give grace to someone for them to keep doing the same foolishness. You give grace to live right and to do the right. Which is why Jesus says, if you're covered by me, you don't need to worry because when I come, you will receive according to your works. In other words, when your life is wrapped up and tied up in Jesus and you're living for him, you don't need to worry when Jesus comes because you know you've been living right for, for Jesus. God doesn't give us grace for us to keep living in sin. He wants us to do right. But if when he comes... You have been living contrary to his will. He says, my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. And so, on that day when Jesus comes, you're either running to him or you're going to be running from him. I don't know about you, but I want to be among those who run to Jesus. What do you say? And so Bible, the Bible therefore tells us this, that what's important for the child of God is that every day you appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Oh, beloved, I know my son is watching right now and my daughter and my wife, they were here for the first service, but they left and I love them both. But the Bible says this, the Bible says this, the Bible says this, that God had one son and he gave him for you. You should be glad I'm not God because I'm giving none of my children for none of you. You would die. But God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son just so you could live. And now, if you appreciate that sacrifice, you must always be in a position where you allow the blood of Jesus to cover your sins because this says... In Revelation 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, 
and there was found no more place. The Bible says that when Jesus takes up this issue of judgment, everything will flee. And look at this now, look at this. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So notice this, notice this. The Bible says that where judgment is concerned, it starts with the dead. And it's talking about the righteous dead because James 4 verse 17 says, judgment begins with the house of God or with God's people. And the Bible says the dead, small, and great standing before God, and the books were opened. So if it says books, it is at least two books because it is plural. And then John saw another book, which is the book of life. Because he says another book was opened. And then he says, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, the Bible makes it clear that the dead aren't standing because they're alive, because they're not in heaven. They are in the grave. We believe that when you die, you don't go to heaven, you don't go to hell, you're not in a state of limbo, you remain in the grave until Jesus comes again. All, spell, all Bible believing Seventh-day Adventists ought to say amen. amen. And here's why this is important. I shared this this morning, I got to share with you. But you see, you should be glad that the dead is dead, you know. You should be glad. Here's why. You, 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 again, ladies, I come to you, I love you all. You, you heard the story about the woman who loved this husband who was a very mean and ridiculous man. And on his deathbed, he said to her, when I die, bury me with all my money. He was filthy rich and he insisted, bury me with my money. He said, I love you, but I'm not leaving any for you. Now, she was an obedient wife. Somebody say amen. Yeah, not getting an amen on that one. That's all right. At the day of the funeral, right before they lowered this man's casket, the wife came and she was crying and she placed a box on top of the casket, which was about not half the size, maybe about quarter the size of the casket. And they lowered it. While that was happening, her friend came to her and said, are you ridiculous? What are you doing? And she said, well, he asked me to honor his request and to bury him with all his money. And she's like, what if somebody come and dig up and get all that money? Or what if somebody, and she's like, no, they're going to seal this very well. And it's a very well-protected cemetery. So, and she's like, you're really burying this man with all his money? And then she said this, well, I, I wrote him a check. If he can cash it, he can have it. <laughs> Preacher, I've learned in this world you will never outsmart a woman, eh? But if he is alive, will he be able to cash that check? He would be, but he is not alive. Why? Because when you're dead, you're dead. And so now the Bible says the dead were judged small and great. And all were judged out of the things that were in the books. And the Bible says, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Folk, I'm in, emphasizing this because on the day of judgment, the day of atonement, in which the people were judged, what was important is this. You had to ensure that your sins were covered by the blood of Jesus or the blood of the Lamb, and you were living in accordance with God's will. Now, the Bible says further, and anyone not found written in the book of life, was cast into a lake of fire. We don't have time to talk about the lake of fire today, but what this is teaching is very important. There are a number of books in heaven, and let me tell you about these books. Listen what Romans 2 verse 3 says. And do you think, O man, that you will escape the judgment of God? None of us will escape it under no circumstance. And again, even if you claim you're a Christian, but you're a hypocrite, you will not escape because Jesus says this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, he practiced lawlessness. You know what that means? Some of us are coming to church and we look well-dressed and we carry on and we have influence and affluence and people think that we are holy and righteous, but only God really knows what's going on in our hearts and in our lives. 
and one day it will be revealed. One day it will be revealed. Walk with the preacher, walk with the preacher. The, this therefore means that if we are not going to be lost, every day we must come to the foot of the cross. You have to come to the foot of the cross, my friend, and plead the merits of Christ's precious blood. Now remember we said, for the Jews, the day of atonement was the tenth day of the seventh month. But Daniel received a vision, and this vision was not for the Jews anymore because when Daniel received this dream, there was no sanctuary. The sanctuary had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But the Bible said Daniel received a dream that for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary should be cleansed. And the question, therefore, is which sanctuary? We know that this is referring to the heavenly sanctuary because it could not be referring to the earthly one. And so, Daniel wanted to understand this vision because the angel had explained the first part about the ram and the he goat, but no one explained the conversation between the two holy ones. And the idea that judgment or the cleansing of the sanctuary would occur in 2,300 days. First, you need to know this, that that prophecy is a symbolic prophecy, meaning that the 2,300 days are not literal. They're symbolic, in which a day represents a year. Ezekiel 4 verse 6 identifies this. It says, a day represents a year. I have laid on you a day for each year. Now, having said that, we want to discover when did the 2,300 days begin? When did it end? Or when does the sanctuary start to be cleansed? William Miller discovered this and we're presenting to you what they discovered and presented. When Daniel couldn't understand Daniel 8 verse 14, he prayed and an angel came and explained to him the vision. And the angel began in Daniel 9 by saying this in verse 24. 70 weeks are cut off or determined for your people. In other words, from the 2,300 days, 70 weeks have been cut off from the first part. And he says, for your people, the holy city, to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make, go to the next slide, to make, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring about, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Let me tell you what this is talking about. Daniel had been praying and saying, God, your people, we have sinned. And God said he was going to give them a second chance. And this second chance would happen during the 70 weeks where they could become God's people as he desired. And he said, you will have 70 weeks to do all of this. 70 weeks, beloved, is not literal. It is symbolic also. And so 70 weeks equals 490 years. And the Bible tells us that God said to Daniel from the declaration to restore Jerusalem to the Messiah will be 69 weeks, which equals 487 years. You can see it right there. So from the time to restore Jerusalem, Ezra chapter 1 onward tells us about this, that the restoration of Jerusalem started in 457 BC. And the angel said to Daniel, from that time to the Messiah, will be 62 uh, and 7 weeks. Know what it says, Daniel 9, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be 7 weeks and 62 weeks. In other words, 69 weeks. 69 times 7 gives you 483, which is 483 years. And let me show you how amazing the Bible prophecy is, beloved, because the Bible said Jesus would come at the end of 483 years and start his ministry. Did that happen? Yes, it did, because in the fullness of time, Jesus came. Galatians 4 verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God can send forth his son. Now I, I'm running fast because time is spent, but I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Let's move beyond these slides. Let's move beyond these slides. The Bible then says, the Bible then says that in the middle of the week, let's go back to the previous slide, in the middle of the week, then he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. What does that mean? 
It means that in the middle of the last week or seven years, Jesus would die. Jesus died in 18, in AD 31. And the Bible tells us that the day when he died, he became or Passover. In reality, the word of God declares that when he died, the priest was about to slay the Passover lamb when there was an earthquake and the veil ran from top to bottom and they were able now, the people were able to see beyond the veil which should not have happened. And the lamb escaped and the knife fell from the priest. And listen to this. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earthquake and the rock were split. And then the Bible says this. Because Jesus died for your sins and mine, we no longer need the blood of bulls and goats. And you know why that is important, beloved? If you and I had to be offering the blood of bulls and goats, the animal population would not be able to keep up with our sinning. Are you hearing the preacher? So you should be grateful that Jesus died for our sins once and for all. If you're grateful, let me hear you say amen. amen. And then the Bible says he would bring an end to sacrifice. He did that. And then it said he would confirm it with them at the end of the week. Stephen was stoned and the Jewish people rejected the Messiah. But then the Bible says, because it takes us to A.D. 34, it means... That that 490 year brings us to AD 34, which means that there is 1,810 1, years left. And when you add that to 1834, it takes us to 1844. And this is when William Miller and the Millerite movement who were studying the prophecies of Daniel believed that Jesus was going to come to the earth to cleanse the earth by fire. But Jesus never came. Why? Because he moved from one phase of the sanctuary to the next. He moved from the holy place that we talked about last night, where your sins are placed, into the most holy place. Which is why Daniel 8 verse 14 says, Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What does this mean? It means that since October 22, 1844, the records of all the righteous the dead and living has been, has been, is being examined. And the sins are being blotted out of the sanctuary in heaven. And the important thing is this, my friends. I know people claim that this is scary, but it needs to be said. The important thing is this. When your name and my name comes up in judgment, we need to make sure that we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore, Jesus is in heaven right now interceding for you and for me. Hebrews 7 verse 24 makes that clear that he's there interceding. He died in this earth which was the outer court. He went into the holy place with his blood and now he's in the most holy Trying to blot out our sins, which is why Hebrews 9, 24 says, not trying, but blotting out our sin. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true. In other words, he didn't enter an earthly sanctuary, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. O oh, folk, if that doesn't solicit an amen for you, from you, something is wrong with you. I say amen. What about you? Amen. He is standing in front of God for you and for me. And he is pleading his blood saying, God, I know Gervin messes up every now and then. And sometimes he doesn't do right. But I believe that if he continues to choose me, my blood is sufficient for him. He's saying the same for you. Because every time you sin, you deserve to die. And the Bible says, not that he should offer himself often. As the high priest enter the most holy place every year. He doesn't need to do that every day. He died once and it is enough. We sang it last night. The blood will never lose its power. 
And now, beloved, now, beloved, with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But no, he died once. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared, and look at this, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hear me, folk. Hear me clearly. Sin cannot exist in the presence of God. And if sin is in my life, sin is in your life, we will not be able to stand before God. And hear me now. This is very important. Because you can't say you're a child of God and last night you were up in the club shaking your booty and doing all sort of things and then come to church think it's all right. No, you can't be a child of God saying you're a child of God. You're smoking, you're drinking, you're prop living a promiscuous lifestyle. You're doing all these things and then come and patronize God every now and then. On the contrary, you need to live with Jesus and give yourself to him every day. As a child of God, you can't live like the world. You can't look like the world. You can't operate like the world. Because when you're under the blood of Jesus, your life cannot be the same. The Bible says he came to put away sin. And look at this. And as it is appointed for men want to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins for many. Now, if there's anything that is really sad, is how ungrateful some of us are. Because the thing that God gave his only son to take away your sin, but you want to keep doing your own thing. Oh, my friend, he wants to save you today. To those who eagerly wait for him, he's coming again. He will appear a second time apart from sin. For salvation. Now, my friend, hear the preacher, hear the preacher, hear the preacher, hear the preacher. Jesus wants to blot out your sin today. But if you have not accepted him and are not covered by his blood, then when judgment is no longer being examined or, or extended to the people of God and comes to you, what's going to happen? So I'm going to put that text one last time. Put it there. First, Peter 4, verse 17. And I'm going to invite my praise team to come because you're going to sing that song for me, the goodness of God. Because God's goodness is running after somebody right now. And what are you doing? Are you going to continue in your foolishness? Or are you going to respond to the grace of Jesus Christ? 1 Peter 4, verse 17. Put it on the screen. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. It started in 1844, October 22. And the truth is none of us know when it will transfer from the house of God. But one thing is certain. Every day you're alive and have an opportunity to respond to the grace of God, it means that you're not beyond the grace of God. And so today, if judgment starts with God's people, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Because... For those of us who are God's people and are living in obedience with his will, judgment is not a bad thing. Judgment is a good thing because it means that God through Jesus will vindicate you and me. But if you've not yet given your life to Jesus, what will your end be? I'm going to end where I ended on Wednesday night. A lady got herself in trouble with the law, related her situation to a friend. The friend said, I know a good lawyer who can represent you. The friend gave her the number for the lawyer and said, call the lawyer. But she delayed and delayed and delayed. Eventually, a week before her case was to go to court, she called the lawyer 
and said, this is the situation. And she outlined the details of her case to the lawyer. And the lawyer listened and listened. And then the lawyer said, ma'am, if you had called me a week ago, I would have been able to represent you. But just yesterday, I was made the judge. And I will be the one who will sit in judgment of your case. Oh, my friend, hear the preacher. If you don't accept him now, one day he will have to be judged. And what will happen? Because the text says, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Finally, finally, finally. A man broke the law and was on his court, way to court to face a judge for breaking the law. While on his way to court, he was still breaking the law with reckless driving. And in the process, he drove through a puddle of water and splashed another driver. When he splashed the driver, he came to a red light and the driver pulled up beside him and said, Sir, well, what did you just do? You just splashed me. And he told the driver some expletives. And as soon as the light turned green, he sped off. Because he didn't want to be late for court. Well, he reached court, and to his surprise, he was very early because the judge just would not show up. And he waited and waited and was getting annoyed and wondering, where is this judge? Finally, the bailiff said, all rise. And when he stood up, to his amazement, the very man who he just splashed and told all these expletives was the judge. You can splash my Jesus all you want now. Ignore him. Disregard him. One day, he will have to come as judge. And the text says, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? God's goodness is running after you. Won't you say yes to Jesus Christ? We're going to sing about the goodness of God. And I want somebody to say yes to Jesus. Sing that song, young man. Yes. Until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. It's all my life you have been faithful. All my life, all your life. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights. In darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I
stand with us, church. my friend that your name is in the book of life so my first appeal is simply this today if you're here today and you know you have not yet accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life you need to accept him I just want to pray for you you've not yet been baptized or you've turned away from him I want to pray for you if that is you won't you just raise your hand right where you are you want your name to be written in the book of life. Won't you raise your hand? Not yet accepted Jesus. And you know you need to say yes to him. God bless you, young man. I see your hand. I know there's somebody else here. You know you have not yet said yes to Jesus. Won't you raise that hand? Some of you have been attending church here for so long and you still have not been baptized. My friend, you want to make sure your name is in the book of life. God bless you. Where are you, my friend? Won't you raise that hand? You want to say yes to Jesus Christ. His goodness is running after you. Why do you keep running from him? Don't worry about people right now. What's more important is that your name is written in the book of life. And God's goodness is pursuing you, but you keep doing your own thing. Won't you say yes to Jesus? Is there one more? Not yet accepted Jesus. You know you need to be baptized or you need to come back to him. I just want to pray for you. Won't you raise that hand? Is there one on this side? Is there one right here? Is there one here? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Is there one more for Jesus? Won't you raise that hand? God bless you, young man. A little child shall lead them. Now here's what you will do. Do what he did. Follow his example. Follow his example. Come and shake the preacher's hand. Come. If you raise your hand, come. I want to shake your hand right here. We are in no rush, my friend, because salvation is more important than anything else. And if you know you need to say yes to Jesus, come. I want to pray for you right here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Stop thinking that it's okay to live a life of sin. God bless you. God bless you. Is there one more? You need to say yes to Jesus. You need to make sure your name is on the book of heaven, on the book of life. God bless you, young man. Come. Come, little ones. Lead them in Jesus' name. But some of us are standing here and you know that you're not living according to God's will. Why won't you say yes to Jesus? Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. All my life, all my life, you've been so faithful. second appeal after we've sung. God bless you. Come little ones, come, come. We're going to get your names. We want to pray with you all. We'll sing. 
of the goodness of God. Hear my second appeal while they're taking their names. Hear my second appeal. And some of us who, we say we're Christians, but we know the way we live is more like the way of the world and not of God. You're living either in concubinage, you're with someone you know you're not supposed to be with, you are doing things you know you're not supposed to do, and I'm saying this to you, my friend. You want to make sure that the blood of Jesus is stamped on your name, which is why he says we will be judged according to our works. Now, don't worry about folk people, because if you know you're not right with God, you need to come and make it right. So as we sing this one last stanza, as we sing again, all my life you've been faithful. If you're here and you know you need to be at the altar, maybe to recommit your life to Jesus or to receive prayer for overcoming, come to the altar. Don't worry about anyone else. Walk to the altar, come. God is good to you, my friend. Say yes to Jesus. I will say, I will say, your goodness is running up to me. I want you to sing that part again. Maybe you're in the overflow. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you say yes to Jesus? Your goodness is running up to me. We have two little ones who have said they want to be baptized today. What do you say? Maybe there's someone else who wants to follow their example. We're ready, my friend. Because if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. Is there someone else but Jesus? Is there someone else but Jesus? Pray with me. Pray with me. Is there someone else but Jesus? Pray with me. God, we're so grateful for your word. While in this world people may try to obscure the clarity of your word, we believe today you have spoken clearly. The truth is you're a merciful God, but you're also a God of justice. And you have found a way to allow righteousness and peace to kiss, mercy and justice to be melded together in what you have done for us through Jesus. Because you have met the demands of the law which says we should die by giving Jesus to die for our sins. And today, God, I thank you for all these who have walked to the altar. And our prayer is that you will seal their decision. We ask, O oh God, that they will understand that it pays to serve Jesus. We want them to understand that it pays to have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, when Jesus comes again, they will run to him and declare, Lo, this is O oh God, we have waited for him, and he is saving us. Save them, O oh God, we pray. But God, there are others here today who are stubborn and who are insisting on living in sin. And our prayer is that you will give them no rest until they find rest in Jesus Christ. Give them no peace until they find peace in the Prince of Peace. And I pray that for all of us who say we are yours, you will help us to live in accordance with your will, not by our strength, 
but by your grace. Thank you for these two precious ones, the children of one of our pastors, Pastor Latoya, who have decided to follow Jesus all the way. And as we baptize them, O oh God, we pray that you will seal them for time and for eternity. This is our prayer in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Let everybody say, if you've filled out a card, please turn it in. And as you go, please know that we'll be calling you, we'll be praying with you, and we will be studying with you. All my life, you've been so good.